Hello and welcome back to the Russian Football News Podcast. We record just ahead of Siska's game of Feyenoord, and because we feel like we've left out the army men a little bit too much of late, our last topic is going to focus solely upon Siska's recent form, now that they've reached the top of the RPL for the first time since September 2019. However, before we get there, we do have three Champions League games to cover in which Russian clubs once again picked up to fail, a, pick, fail to pick up a single victory. This is the lowest percentage of points available this halfway point ever picked up by Russian clubs in the Champions League, despite having three in the group stages for the first time ever. Now, as a quick disclaimer, it is bonfire night in the in the UK, so do not worry if you do hear a loud bang in the background. They're not gunshots, but just the hum of some fireworks in the distance. Joining me this week to unpack all of this is David Sanson. Good evening, good evening. And Richard Pike. Good evening, everybody. How are we all? Yeah, I'm good again. Thanks, mate. I'm really, really excited to get this one down because, first of all, Local started us off on Tuesday hosting Atletico Madrid at the RZD Arena. Marco Nikolic named the same side that almost earned a point against Bayern through a resolute defensive performance. And this week, they did the same again. Atleti started the game on the front foot, with Luis Suarez and João Felix making a real nuisance of themselves. But the opening goal came from perhaps an unlikely source. Hector Herrera crossed in, and Jose Jimenez was able to saunter into the box unmarked and head home. Guillermo totally missed the ball at a very savable height, and it was a pretty weak goal to concede from his point of view. However, the game did turn again in 10 minutes. Fyodor Smolov advanced down the right channel and crossed for Zilowish. But Hector Herrera blocked the ball with his arm in the box and a penalty was given. Now, it did seem quite harsh to me. The ball bounced off Herrera's face, I believe, and onto his arm. And it was very much like the one given for Chelsea against Krasnodar. And in the rules of the game, thus should not have been given. But karma does tend to work in weird ways. And us fans of Russian football in general got the rub of the green here, unlike last week. Anton Moranchuk duly buried the pen, sending Oblak the wrong way. And then Correa came, came closest after this, pinging a long shot off the bar with Guilherme again totally muddled in nowhere in, in what was a series of errors. But it did end 1-1 at the break. Atleti came out roaring to go again and dominated large periods of the second half. But this time Guilherme sorted himself out and was in fine form, more than making up for his two first half errors. That was him all over. He's just as likely to make a big error as he is a worldly save. And two in close succession from João Felix were real highlights. However, for large stages, Atleti just couldn't find a way to break Loco down and were resorting to long pot shots and crosses into the box for a lot of the time. The only time they did was a header bounced off the bar and flew straight into Luis Suarez's path, who buried the, buried the ball home. But he was miles off sides and the flag was raised even before the ball crossed the line. Thus, it finished a brilliant 1-1 for Loco as Bayern slaughtered Red Bull at Salzburg 6-2 in the other fixture. So David, I've got to start with that penalty. Do you think it was the correct decision? It did seem very similar, like I said, to the incident with which uh, Martinovic suffered in last week. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we, I know we've seen one in the, in the RPL recently as well, but I can't remember uh, which which teams were involved. Um, but yeah, any, any ball, I mean, if we're going off the FA's rules, which I'm pretty sure should apply to the Champions League, uh, you know, if the ball hits a part of your own body before hitting your arm, uh, it, it, it's not a penalty. And uh, you know, it, it probably shouldn't have been given, but it was. Uh, and, and, you know, we'll take it because uh, you know, we, we need every bit of luck we can get in the Champions League this season, it seems like. But, um, but yeah, well, it wasn't a penalty, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I, I do think that local deserve credit and especially Nikolic, even in spite of this not being a penalty. Now, De Serb got his tactics absolutely spot on again. Perfect defensive performance from a player. So, I mean, the team is made up of seasoned professionals generally and, and other very promising defenders who are just solid at this sort of game. But, Richard, how do you rate Nikolic up against Yuri Sioman? And do you think perhaps appointing a foreign manager is something that the other Champions League sides could look towards? Yeah, I concur, James, regarding uh, Nikolic and his tactics. I think he got them um, absolutely spot on. 
Um, and just like the last two games, you know, where he, he got them right as well. Um, he kept things nice and tight defensive with the shape. I mean, it was a disappointing goal that they conceded. But, you know, in general, these last three games and against Atleti earlier in the week, they were nice and tight and compact with the shape. And crucially, they stay in games as well, Loco. Even when they were goal down, you know, against Bayern and against Atleti, they were in the game both times. They didn't concede a second. The heads didn't drop. So mentally as well, Nikolic has got them in a good state. Um, and just compare that to um, to Schumann's last two Champions League campaigns with Loco. It's chalk and cheese, um, especially the first of those campaigns. I mean, remember that group that um, Loco got in 2018-19? It was Porto, who, you know, are still a decent side in European competition. Uh, but he also got Schalke, who were struggling that season under the, in the Bundesliga, ironically under Domenico Tedesco, and um, Galatasaray, who've been poor in Europe for a number of years now. And yet you look at how poorly Loco performed in that group, you know, much, much more easier on paper anyway than by an Atletico and Salzburg. Um, so, yeah, Nikolic absolutely is doing so much better than Schumann did in Europe. Consider, and consider as well, Schumann had Alexi Moranchuk at his disposal as well. And, you know, Nikolic has had to deal with losing losing Alexi Moranchuk and having Dimitri Baranov out injured with um, an ACL injury. And he didn't have Fedor and Chorluka as well. Um, and, um, you know, he didn't have Chorluka too in defence. So I think considering all that, I think Nikolic is, is really outperforming um, Schumann in Europe with Loco. 100%. Onto the question of foreign coaches. Um, well, I absolutely think that one explanation for poor displays of Russian clubs in European competition in the last couple of years, I certainly think um, the question now has to be raised whether or not Russian coaches are actually that good. Um, I think the answer to that is no, not particularly. Um, you know, Loco and Siska, based on performance and results so far for the RPL clubs in Europe, have been the best two performing sides so far this season. Um, and, you know, they both have non-Russian managers, you know, because Goncharenko's from Belarus and uh, Nikolic is from Serbia. And, you know, and look at the other clubs as well, like, um, you know, Kononov compared to um, Tedesco at Spartak. Tedesco is getting much more out of Spartak than Kononov uh, did. And uh, I, even in two games on the Shandro Schwartz, I'm seeing way more from an attacking point of view and from a coaching point of view than I ever saw um, um, Dinamo under um, Novikov. Novikov, that's it. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> mind escaped me for a moment then. So yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, just went for a moment then. Yeah, so already just two games in, you know, Dinamo are getting way more from Schwartz on the Schwartz's coaching. So so yeah, I, it, at the moment you're probably looking at the only one of the top six or seven teams or seven teams in the league at the minute who could have a Russian manager next season could well be Slutsk, could be Slutsky at Rubin because you probably have to say at the minute he's the best Russian coach you know based on his track record with Siska and the fact that he's coached abroad outside the RPL as well um, so yeah I think Russian football at the minute is undergoing a real coaching crisis at present it's almost a bit like England was 10 years ago when there weren't very many good English managers of of any note, and I think Russia's in a situation like that right now. Um, there really is such yeah. a lack of lack of them, you know. Um, so I would actually not be surprised to see, pretty much apart from apart from Rubin, all the big Russian clubs managed by foreigners next season. You know, it wouldn't it would not surprise me at all. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's I I agree that there is definitely a crisis of of among Russian. Russian coaches right now at the highest level. There's a lot of young, promising coaches coming up through the Fin L and the Pay for L, but there always will be. There always is. They can only afford Russian coaches. But in in the elite level right now, there's kind of this managerial merry-go-round to to an extent where these these Russians just keep these Russian uh, fellows who are sometimes a little about their depth keep getting given the job because they're a big name and they're a safe name. A lot of these coaches are defensive or safety first. And it's just not ideal whatsoever for when it comes to European competition specifically. And I think a large reason of that issue is, is like you say, the lack of coaches in the country. Russia's got one of the smallest amount of coaches per capita in the entirety of Europe. It, I mean, it, it, it sounds crazy that Germany have got more coaches than Russia when you see the size of Russia and the population of the country. But it's it's the price of costing of how much it costs to get the coaching badges in Russia, which is particularly difficult. I mean, that is not just a Russian issue. It's 
it's a European issue. UEFA charge an unbelievable amount of money for the for the Class A coaching license, and that's why Murad Masayev still hadn't hadn't got it, and and technically had to be a. It had to be last season. It was uh, another name on the on the managerial list, and not his, because he didn't have his coach coaching license for the for the elite level. So, and that, and that does filter down into individual countries, and the RFU cost an absolute bomb for for the coaching badges. So, yes, it would be good that to get a, a, a foreign manager in right now to. Because they will more than likely play play expansive football. Look at Tedesco, some of the stuff he's got Spartak playing. Like you say, Schwarz in literally two games is you, you've seen Komlachenka less isolated than in the six weeks beforehand, even though he's still not been too great individually. But the, the issue then stems down from a lack of real good quality young Russian coaches coming through at the elite level because of the price. But if you talk about good young Russian players who have been coming through at the elite level, one of the Biggest ones is probably Anton Marantchuk of late, and today he actually signed a new five-year contract to Lokomotiv. Now he scored again for the second game in a row, first against Bayern, now against Atletico, albeit from the penalty spot. But David, how do you think that Antoshka is faring so far in Europe? Well, he's having, you know, he's got to take on the big responsibility of, of filling his uh, his brother's shoes, who, you know, they they take in turns really over over the past few years. There was a, there was a period there. For the World Cup, where Anton was was the better player, he was certainly playing better. He scored a lot more goals, um, and and I know that for most of his his career, he's been touted as the most talented of the of the duo, um, which which says something because obviously we know how good Alexei is, um, and then obviously the last couple of years Alexei really stepped up and he was just on another level. He's he's now got abroad. Anton Anton stepped up well. He's he's the guy domestically and in, in Europe who's you know, he he looks like he is one of the more talented players in the team, if not the most talented in that midfield in terms of his technical skill. Uh, and he's popping up with the goals where it's needed. You know, it was a very it was a very good goal he scored against uh, Bayern Munich a couple of weeks ago. Popped up with a goal against Sochi when they needed it over the over the weekend, although they still lost. Um, and you know he he took the responsibility of taking a penalty in the Champions League against one of the best goalkeepers in the world, and he buried it. Um, you know, like Loco having to deal with le- you know very very small amounts of possession, but he he's doing well, uh, and he's proven himself. And I must admit, I was slightly surprised when the contract uh, announcement came. I was uh, I was thinking he would hold out until January and potentially decide to. Go abroad because it was his contract was due up at the end of this season. And I was thinking he would he would look at how Alexei is getting on and maybe use that as as inspiration to to maybe go abroad himself. Maybe he's just doing locomotive a favor. You know, he doesn't want to leave and uh, you know not gain them any money. Maybe he's signing up and he will leave anyway. But you know, if he's not, if that's his plan to stay in Russia for for the next you know until twenty twenty four. Fair enough, you know he, he's a very good player. He, he probably could end up being a one club player. Uh, you know, you, you'd have liked to if he if he carried on his form, see him maybe challenge himself. You know, he, he's proving himself now that he's, I think he's proving himself to to be stepping up into the better role. Um, but you know, it looks like maybe another player who who may decide not to not to leave the comfort of Russia and, and challenge himself abroad. I must admit, it would be. Thoroughly depressing if Moranchuk does spend his uh, Anton, of course, does spend his entire career in in Russia at Lokomotiv. It's only just recently that we've really seen lots of Russian players start to move abroad again. With with of course Golovin and and, and Alexei Moranchuk and so on. And Russia has among the lowest of any player uh, percentage of any players playing abroad anywhere right now so it's of course they're very comfortable where they live and in, in russia and that's entirely fair enough look i'm english and england is just down there with russia as well but it would be really good to see anton go out and uh, well first of all really establish himself in his role at locomotive where he is now clearly the main man and then moving on from there it'll be really good um but now some of us at rfn have been having a little bit of a debate at late about one man in particular and that's Guilherme in goal. Now, in my opinion, he is a, a real Jekyll and Hyde character. In the first half, he made three huge errors. 
one of which led to a goal and two of those he was bailed out by poor finishing in his crossbar. And then in the second half, he galvanised himself to such an extent and pulled a hat out for a string of super saves, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, the ones from João Felix. So, David, quickly go back to you yourself. Um, what do you think of our naturalised Russian in goal? Is he more Jekyll or Hyde? Oh, I forget which of those is the bad one, actually. Um, but let's just say he is more leaning towards the bad one. Um, you know, <laughs> it, it was... It, it's... It's strange to think because Loco have got one of the highest clean sheet percentage in the league this season. Uh, but I'd more likely put that down to the tactics that Nikolic employs, which is largely very defensive. Um, and also having a decent decent back line, especially two good centre-halves in Choluca and Marulo, uh, who, by the way, was excellent against uh, Atletico. Um, but we, we still see Guillermo making mistakes regularly. Uh more so than than some of the other high profile goalkeepers in the league, you know, if Akinfeya wasn't retired, he he'd undoubtedly still be the number one. Um, but we're, we're seeing Guillerme, Shunin, Janaev being called up to the national team of late. Uh, Shunin made big mistakes for for Dino, which cost them their, their bit in Europe. Um, he then also made mistakes when he when he went into the national team during the last international break. Guillerme's been dropped from the national team as as number one because of his mistakes. Janayev's now not in at all, and we're seeing Safonov come in. Obviously, he had a high-profile mistake uh, last week, but improved this week, as I'm sure we'll discuss later. Um, you know, I think there, there are plenty of other goalkeepers. Russia is blessed with very good goalkeepers. Uh, a lot of them just haven't had the chance to be tested at that next level. Guillaume has been and has and not done it, I don't think, uh, you know, international or, or European level for his club. Um, but, you know, there are others who who deserve the chance. You've got Belanov, you've got Dupin, Safonov, Maximenko. You know, these these guys deserve a chance. They're, they've been putting in good performances regularly over the past couple of years. Uh, but Churchisov, who obviously was a goalie himself, uh, keeps sticking with the uh, with Guillaume for for whatever reason. You know, he I'll give him credit. He he was fantastic in the second half. Pulled off a lot of good saves, uh, particularly the Jao Felix one. Um. But yeah, it's uh, for me. I, I wouldn't have him in the national team anymore, personally. I think I think his his time is up. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's bizarre that we've had so many goalkeepers making mistakes, kind of all at the same time, and all and all high profile. As you mentioned, the current the current choice for the Spornaya team for the international break is Ishun and Guillermo and Safanov, and all three of them have made high profile mistakes of late. Um, Safanov, I think was an aberration, it was an anomaly. We'll get more onto that later. But I feel sorry for goalkeepers at times because they really aren't hiding to nothing at times. They are known, known as the outsider and, and, and loner in that extent. And not because they're lonely characters, maybe, but because they, it's a lonely position in the squad. If a striker makes 10 mistakes a game and let's put a mistake down as missing a pretty glorious chance and, and then scores one, they're still the hero. If the goalkeeper makes 10 brilliant saves and then one giant absolute cock-up, then they're the villain. It's just the nature of being a goalkeeper and the concentration levels. I feel so sorry for them to an extent when they do they make these mistakes. But Guillermo was such an, a savable shot and such an unforced error. And obviously, Stani, with being a goalkeeper himself, he's part of the goalkeeper's union. He's obviously... Showing a putting an arm around these these three and and saying look you're my three and and going to go ahead with that, but once again it, it is Jekyll and Hyde and David Hyde is the is the uh, the bad one and and it's it's just um, more of the same from Guillermo if only he was he was more of the Jekyll character and and really r- save some of these ugh, pretty simple shots and. And you could be talking about a local victory against Atletico. And it, it's all what-ifs again for the second week in a row. And of course, again, with the what-if, what we'll have to move on now to, in my opinion, the most disappointing side of the three so far, and that's Zenit. Now, they kicked off hosting Lazio at the Gaspar Marina first on Wednesday. And the start of this game was immediately different to the Dortmund one. They attacked on the front foot and, and looked far more progressive than what was a promising start for Semak's side. And part of this was thanks to Lazio's own depleted team with nine out due to COVID-19 uh, inconclusive tests and other related issues with 
uh, the length of quarantine. But Sergei Samak also returned to his tri- tried and tested 4-4-2 formation, starting uh, Zhirkov on the left, chosen ahead of Andrei Mostovoy, who's on the bench, uh, Kuzayev on the right, and then partnered Artem Zuba with Alexander Yorokin. And Zenit started exactly as you would expect. The game was about pressing from the outset, receiving the ball, getting up to Zuba and Yorokin as quickly as possible. Half an hour in, the pair combined brilliantly in the air, and Zuba set up Yorokin to scissor kick volley into the net and take a deserved lead. From this moment, Lazio did grow a little bit into the game, but Zenit went, went into the break ahead and most certainly on merit. For the second half, they again dominated the first 15 minutes. However, Lazio did begin to grow back into the game as the home side dropped further and further back. And the front two really stopped pressing the defensive line as much. I don't know if this was just a little bit of fatigue creeping in with the sheer amount of games that they've been playing recently or not. But it really allowed a Serbian court to step up and start to play the Lazio way, how Inzaghi likes his team playing, of dictating from deep and progressing up the pitch very high with a very high defensive line. And with just 10 minutes remaining, Lazio were well on top. And Zenit were camped just outside their own box. And, and Sergei Semak really could have introduced some fresh legs into the midfield at this point, but none were coming. Uh, Philippe Saicedo linked well out wide before strolling into the box, perhaps pa- past Magomed Ozdoyev and Dala Kuzyayev, who were really just mocking nobody. Once again, maybe that tiredness aspect coming in, coming back from an attack. But Dejan Lovren crucially slipped at the wrong time as a Serbi crossed the ball in. It passed the Lovren, who was just kind of trying to get back up from his slip. And and uh, Saicedo, of course, came off the bench once again to score as he got on the end of it quite nicely. Now, it was good play from Lazio. It was good ball in and a really good finish. Kurzhagov had absolutely no chance with it. But then again switched off and just allowed them to walk through the defence, just like they did against Bruges. Now, then it did take the initiative again late on. And Andre Mostovoy thought he had scored right at the death, but it was given offside. Artyom Zuba played him in really nice, the little one-two, and that square pass was a really good pass from Zuba. But in receiving the ball, he was just beyond the beyond the Lazio defensive line and was offside. Now, he had ample time to get back on side, but be it a lack of foresight, laziness, tiredness, whatever, he didn't. And I thought it really was quite lazy played from Zuba in his head not to see the chance, not to get back on side. Now, the game did end 1-1, and although the performance was much improved from previous ones, you do have to wonder if Zenit are already out of the UCL at only the halfway point of the group stages. So, David, i quickly come back to you once again. That Lazio goal, for me, was just far too easy. Do you think there's anyone in particular to blame there or, or not? Um, <clears throat> I mean, we, we, we'll we go look at the goal again after, uh, just before the podcast here. Um, and without seeing the full stretch of maybe 30 seconds to a minute before the goal, it's, it's hard to really say. Because Doev was obviously caught up the pitch uh, from the previous Zenit foray forward. Uh, and he was getting that very slowly, you know, just 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 a snail's pace jog, really. You know, not not enough. You know, Saicedo was sat in the space between between the lines uh, of defence and, and midfield. Kuzayev and, and Barrios both got drawn to the near side towards the ball, and it left uh, two runners both surrounding Ostoyev really um, as the as the sole remaining midfielder there with Mostavoy um, and Zubas stuck upfield. Uh, so, so you're looking at the of uh, and his lack of energy, but as you said, it, it's that down to you know the poor management, not not sub, subbing earlier because uh, you know there, there was no subs after Mostavoy until uh, Sutormin and and Wendell came on in the death, the right of death, um, and then obviously Christy, as you say, we we spotted the Lovren the Lovren slip, which if he doesn't slip, he, he almost certainly intercepts that ball. He, he's about two two yards from where it goes goes across right in front of him. Uh, and Sosedo just has a free run on, on straight onto the ball. So sort of a catalogue of maybe poor management, lack of energy, a bit of, a bit of misfortune with the slip as well. Um, so without really blaming it, I don't particularly want to blame anyone in, in, in particular um, because you know, there, I'm sure there are reasons for everything there. Um, but ultimately, I, well, certainly not blame a player in particular. Um, I think ultimately, mm-hmm. if... If there was a different midfielder on the pitch with a bit who you know who had a bit more energy, um, it, maybe it could have made the difference. Who, who knows? It was just a, a cacophony of all these things that came to to bite Zenit back in in the worst of ways. But regardless of who could be blamed individually, 
Richard, considering the amount of players the Italian the Italian side missed, do you think this was an avoidable result? Could Semak have been more proactive in changing it? And or do you think do you think Zenit just dropped far too deep by the end of the game? Yeah, they were very deep, weren't they? Um that's one thing I did notice. Um it's frustrating because I think that, that that's Again, with Semat in Europe, is is he too defensive? I think you know. Con- con- consider as well that this Lazio side were missing a lot of players due to COVID and due to injury. You know, when you were goal up, I think considering the first sixty minutes of the game was really good, I really was a bit disappointed that it didn't really push for a second goal. You know, I mean, ov- obviously they had that chance with Mostavoy; it was a good chance, and it it, it fizzed just wide of the post, agonisingly just wide of the post. Um, but what was frustrating after that was then it's sort of like they took the foot off the gas. Again, maybe it comes down to midfield. The frustrating thing for me was why wasn't Vendel on the pitch earlier? You know, he came on in the 88th, I think it was 88th, 89th minute. I looked at Lazio and just bef- and just after, I think it was either just before or just after the Mostovoy substitution, um, they introduced um, Danilo Cataldi and Andres Pereira, two midfielders Lazio. So obviously they got fresh legs in midfield and yeah, I, I just felt it was a bit strange why he didn't introduce a sub in midfield. Obviously, the midfield gets through most of the work in the game and, you know, provides you with the spark to get up the pitch in the final third. And yeah, they they they, they, they really dropped very, very deep, Zenit. And I, I, I was going into that last, before Lazio scored, I was really fearful of them. I'm thinking, do you know what? They're going to score here, Lazio. I honestly have I have very little faith now when watching Zenit in Europe. It's it's very, very difficult because you just never feel certain, even when they're winning a game, even when they're playing well, you just never feel certain at the moment. And yeah, again, I think Samak, again, tactically, I think he's getting found out in Europe, I'm afraid. Um, you know, the, it's, it's, it's even at the stage now where if Zenit were in the Europa League group stages, you know, they'd have a job on to get out. You know, I'm really not convinced by them at the moment. It's it's not good. Um yeah, Wendell yeah. Wendell should have been introduced earlier. I think there's there's no doubt about that. Um, you know, he, he he's been impressive whenever he's played so far for Zenit and it was far too late to bring him on. I mean, admittedly Zenit had a had a smaller bench, um, which didn't didn't help them. You know, there wasn't a huge amount he could do rather than Mostavoy and Wendell. Um which didn't help. You know, Asmoon and Malcolm not being available, you know, that's that's not that's not helpful for any coach, but but Lazio had more players unavailable, so yeah, it's it's disappointing because the performance was really good until about the 65th, 60th, until about 60th, 65th minute. That was spot on from Zenit in, in Europe. They were playing well, you know, it was looking yeah, looking absolutely. good. And then I think, yeah, just he, he lost control in the, in, in the halfway through the second half by not introducing Vendel in that midfield. I felt crying out for some fresh legs in there. I think my issue with Semak is that. It- Look, I, I wrote my preview quite extensively about how he needs to be progressive, how he needs to get this right. Zenit are Zenit in the RPL. They've got a second team to, win, to be fine in the RPL. They're going to finish in the Champions League spots no matter what. They're probably going to have the very good chance of winning the league. Semak's really under pressure in the Champions League. That's what Yevgeny Miller is absolutely desperate for, is his Zenit run into the Champions League. And to be fair, to be fair, the entire RPL is desperate for a Zenit deep run in the Champions League. They've underperformed for far too long now. And Semak, he is a very good manager when his plan A is working. When his plan A is on spot on, Zenit are a very difficult team to beat and they're very, very good. When, the, of course, all the players are there, which to be fair, they're not. Asmund's out, Malcolm's out. But when their plan A is, is on point, they can rip teams apart. But even in the RPL, how often have you seen Zenit and Semak proactively t- t- turn the game on its head. Now, that wasn't the case here. Zenit were well on top. All he had to do was be a little bit more proactive and far less reactive and get some fresh legs on and get the team pushed up, pressing a bit higher. Now, I, I do sympathise. Injuries, fatigue, huge issues. But Lazio were more fatigued. They've played more games in a shorter space of time and they had considerably more injuries. It's inexcusable again from Zenit. And it's I don't want to jump on Semak too much because there was other extenuating circumstances. But he got it all so right and then just wasn't proactive enough. It's just so disappointing. Richard, what do you think? It's got it's almost a bit I, I agree, James. It's it's almost a bit like he's getting a reputation for being a bit of a uh, a Russian Antonio Conte, if you know what I mean, because you know Inter Milan and Conte. Whenever he's been in Europe, he's not done it. You know, it, however it be at Juventus, at Chelsea, and now at Inter. And I think Samak sadly is going down the same route. 
Um, you know, even back to his first season when that was the best season in Europe, when, you know, in, in European football, when he got to the last 16 of the Europa League and then lost to Villarreal. But even that season, you know, Zenit weren't brilliant in Europe. They they had that they had that shocking 4-0 loss to Dinamo Minsk. OK, they came through in the second leg. But to lose 4-0 to Dinamo Minsk was an eye-opener from the start. They were OK in the group stages. They got through, but even the likes of Slavia mm. Prague gave them two good games. And then they only just crept through against Fenerbahce in the last 32 against, you know, the weakest Fenerbahce side in years. And then last season, you know, what's worrying me more is that at least if they went out last season with seven points, finishing bottom of the group, they were unlucky to finish bottom of the group last season. You know, in another group, they might have finished third because it was it was a tough group. And, you know, they were putting in some yeah. good performances like Leipzig away. They only just lost that game. They beat Leon and drew with, the, drew with Leon away and beat them at home and beat Benfica at home. This season in Europe, though, the performances, with the exception of that first half and bits of the second half against Lazio, the performances have not been great. You know, that's that's what's yeah. concerning me more. Not just the results, but the performances. If the results were good, eventually they'd turn the corner. Well, sorry, the performances, performances were good. You'd like to think the results would turn the corner, but the performances have been really slack. Mm. So it's a concern, definitely. Yeah. And now there is, of course, the other side of the coin. Now, Semak did get it right, and he got it right for the 60 minutes. So was the issue him himself, or was the issue the players? Now, one in particular, Artem Zuba, has could have had two assists on the night and be hailed as a relative hero if they won 2-0 or 2-1 even. But these fine margins of this level means that's not the case. Now, interestingly, I'm glad you mentioned the Dino Minsk game, Richard, because since his hat-trick in that 8-1 victory against Dino Minsk, uh, he's only scored four goals in 17 matches in Europe. So do you th- is he good enough for the, for the for the Champions League anymore? Now, Hanu has tweeted out on the RFN Twitter this... this um, this question and uh, and all the statistics. Now, some some of the replies were had at Rio Felix ten, who said that Zuba is an incredible player, but he also needs more incredible players to help him score the goals. Didn't expect too much for Zenit three Champions League games, but hope that they will qualify to the Europa League. We got at Angi Sirowaya. It's time for Zenit to look for another fresh option. Zenit and Spornaya have to stop glorifying him. He does respect what he did, but can't deny he was a killer back then but slowly getting worse and losing his power. We've got at Iggy Gustavo, who said that Zuba's a player who needs good working teammates. If it's not come together, then it doesn't look good for himself. And at Tips League One, overrated player. So I've went in on Semak for a little while. So my question to you, David, is could this be on Zenit? Are the Zenit the players good enough for the Champions League? Hmm. <clears throat> I mean, when it comes to Zuba... Um... I would lean more to the fact that he probably is good enough. Um, you know, the, the play for the first goal, well, for the goal that Zenit scored, was, was just phenomenal target man play. And if, you, if you're a team who plays with a big target man, he's got to be up there as one of the top five in the world like for that role. He, he's a phenomenal hold-up player. Um, you know, he's not even necessarily the best in the air. You know, he's not a guy who's going to jump up and score a powerful header. And you look at Juba's headers in his career, I bet, the most chance, most of them would be flick-ons. Or, mm-hmm. you know, I'm thinking now, I can't think of any time where he scored a proper powerful header. I probably would guess he actually scores more with his feet. Um, yeah. Because he's he's just in the box and he's just there. But he's just so... He is very good at what he does. Um, and, and Zenit's best system for operating with that is to have direct and quicker players around him where that hold-up play actually means something. Um, you know, with, with the setup that they had yesterday... Until Mostovoy came on, they had no one who was going to really make good direct runs with the ball or without the ball. Um, and we saw, you know, twice uh, in that second half, Mostovoy, you know, created chances, one by himself and one not by himself, one with Zuba's help. Um, so, yeah, I, I think Zenit's squad on their day... <coughs> sorry, sorry, apologies. Um, on the day, the quality is there, you know. Barros is is a fantastic defensive midfielder, um, and, and can certainly play at a, at a higher level. Uh, and as yeah. Moonzuba trio and uh, Malcolm trio up front is on paper a very very threatening um, set of players. The the squad should be competing in my opinion. Granted, they they had they were lacking uh, Zuba uh, not Zuba as Moon and, and Malcolm this week, which was you know a big miss. But, um, Juicy too, and Juicy of course, yeah. So I think I think the squad is good enough. 
they've had some bad luck, but the management isn't there. I know obviously we talk, we've talked about this before. I'm sure we can talk about it again, but you know, it's, it's a very big question as to whether they go abroad. Obviously there's plenty of rumors now about Pochettino and, and things like that, but whether that's, whether that's true, I'm not quite sure. I'm sure we'll find out eventually. Um, but it is getting to the point where you're thinking of, you know, should, should they go abroad if they really want to challenge in Europe? We've seen it fail for them in Europe with foreign managers. We've seen it work for them in Europe with foreign managers. It's a, it's a tough question. Yeah, it, it's a tough issue to try and unpack in general. It seems to be every the, the, every single one of these, SEMAC, injuries, uh, transfer window, foreign limits, uh, lack of depth, all are uh, individual errors all are kind of amalgamating right now to, to create what has happened to Zenit and is the first time they have ever lost, not lost both games of the opening two in the UCL, not picked up a single point since, well, picked up one. The last time they hadn't won both was in 2013. This is the first time they've lost both. And also, obviously, knock-on effect, the first time they haven't picked up a win in the first three at all ever as well. So it seems like all of these are just um, mixing together to create the nadir, really, right now for Zanit. And and I, I do think the biggest one, arguably, right now, is as simple as... I agree with definitely what some of the guys on Twitter said, that Zuba is... An unbelievable target man. He's one of the best back to goal in the world. I, I definitely agree with that. But he needs a Malcolm. He needs Asmoon. He needs three you see around him to help work. And 37 year old Yuri Zhirkov, he just, I mean, you might as well just play 10 men. He's not going to do anything on the left wing in the Champions League in 2020. Come on, why the hell is he starting? But once again, that's Semak. So I want to try and move on now away from the horror show up in St. Petersburg because. On Wednesday, directly after that game, Krasnodar rounded off the Champions League action away at Sevilla. And they were immediately under the cosh. As Span- the Spanish side really played some excellent, fast-paced attack and play, led by Joan Jordan, Ivan Rakitic and Lucas Ocampos early on. Now, they had won a pe- the thought they had won a penalty. When Sharpie could have been a judge to either have handled the ball or fouled Ocampos, it wasn't quite sure which one it was actually given for. But after the penalty was given, it was rightfully overturned by VAR. Uh, the ball did hit Sharpie's hand, but bounced off another part of his body and was not the penalty that Logo also shouldn't have got. So Krasadar rightfully survived that one. Later on in the game, Marcus Berg was brought down in the edge of the box through on goal. And Sharpie himself stepped up and killed the ball beautifully into the top left-hand corner, open the score. And just after this, VAR was again in the limelight. And Berg again was fouled in the box this time by Kunde. Two incidents happened at once, and we all thought it was going to be the foul on Sharpie, but in fact, it was the one in Berg that they had given the went to VAR for, and he converted the penalty absolutely brilliantly. Really good penalty. And Sevilla came back into the game just before half time. Ivan Rakitic scored a very good header from Jordan's wicked cross. And then in the fourth minute of first half injury time, Jesus Navas was sent off for a professional foul before VAR even had to intervene just when Sevilla looked on top, and that was a very good decision. It was definitely a red card. Now, Julian Lopetegui made two changes in the first half, uh, ta- in, the, in which he was quite surprised. We've seen three changes altogether from both sides of the first. You don't see very often at all. And not long after half-time, he introduced Yusuf Nesli. Now, 10 minutes after he came on, he actually scored twice, and Sevilla were then up on the night 3-2. The first came from another unforced Kayo error, which we'll get to later. And he woefully gave it away at the back. And then another bit of bad luck where Rakitic is unbelievable cross, by the way. What, what a ball in. Cannoned off the post and straight back into a Nesri's pass, path, who instinctively scored with a good finish. Krasnodar tried to make their man advantage count in vain, but did come close once or twice with Berg and Chernov and Olsen in particular is a big miss. But they couldn't get that goal back and lost against 10 men despite being 2-0 up. Now, Victor Klaassen and Vanderson did both come on in the, to make their UCL group stage debuts and, and the impact was clear to see and it was a real bonus for Krasnodar. And hopefully them and Remy Cabela will be back after the two-week break and they can try and push ahead to get that third place finish with those three back in the team. So Richards, quickly on that VAR first. So as rather <laughs> David rather wonderfully equipped last night, Krasnodar, they really took advantage of those two <laughs> advantageous decisions. Krasnodar. So, 
quick on this one, Richard. Do you think they were the right calls? Yeah, I think they were both the correct decisions. Um, I think when you look at the replay, um, the defender is severe. He, he caught Berg with um, with his he caught Berg's foot just after the ball had left Berg. So I think that was a penalty. And then yeah, I think there's there's no no alternative for the referee with the Navas um, foul. He he was through on goal and he brought him down. And the, um, yeah, it was a red card. So yeah, I think both the decisions. I think both the decisions were correct. Yeah, both decisions were correct. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's <laughs> it's it's weird that all of this happened all in one half of football. But for once, I'm not going to castigate VAR and have a go because yeah, they were they were all completely fine, and it's nice that they all went Krasnodar's way after the Martinovic incident last week. Now, one player who did have a game to forget, of course, was Yevgeny Chernov, who was really beaten time after time by both Navas and then when he went off, Lucas Ocampos, who took over on the right-hand side. Now, Kayo, who was actually fine for the most part, did make that howler. And this is now the third game in a row in Europe in which he's done so. And David and I actually had a quite, quite an interesting debate last night on Kayo. So, David, I'll let you go first. What do you think of the Brazilian centre-back? Well, we, we've talked about him a disproportionately high amount of times on this podcast now, I feel like. It's, it's strange to talk about centre-back so much uh, over the past few months. Um, you know, he statistically and for the most part is a good defender. He's, you know, he's a bit uh, a bit wild with some of his movements and he's a bit sort of uh, a bit overzealous sometimes, but he's very good in the tackle. Uh, he's calm on the ball. He's got a decent passing range. And, and for the most part, he yeah, he does a very good job. And last night, you know, I was, I was sat there at 2-1 two, two, thinking, you know, Sorokin and Kaya are having a, having a good game here so far. Uh, is that, well, actually, I, I must be I actually didn't say Kaya's name. I said Sorokin. Sorokin was having a great game. Like, when they brought him on a half-time, I was, I was worried. But uh, he had a fab fab second half. Uh, but Kaya, Kaya had been solid as well. You know, Sevilla were very good on the night. You know, we, we said, you know, that first 10 minutes when they got what we, we thought at the time was a penalty, you know, it was it was looking like it was going to be a very long night for, for Krasnodar. Um, but they held their own, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know what Kai was, was thinking. It was just um, just a poor touch. He obviously just didn't know the other guy was there. And it's, yeah, it's not good from him. Um, not good at all. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's something we've talked about multiple times, you know, Krasnodar's defenders aren't good enough, you know, it was it was madness for them to have ditched Spajic at the start of the season, which I, I can only assume was not a football decision, but presumably personal decision from him or the, maybe disagreement with the, with the coaching or the staff or whatever. Um, you know, and that's the situation they've been left in with that and the limit combining to 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 leave them in this difficult, difficult predicament where they've got a talented group of foreign midfielders and attackers uh, and they have to just deal with what they can in, in defence, which... You know, when you're taking the pick of Kayo plus whatever you can get in Russia as you send the halves, it's not the best pool of players to pick from. Um, you know, if he could eliminate those those errors from his game, which um, you know we we had the the one in in Wren where he scuffed his his clearance. The the one against Chelsea, I'm I'm willing to say was not really a big error. Um, you know, it was. It was given as a penalty, but it was so marginal. You know, he he was a split second from nabbing that ball, um, and then this week, you know, lap, laps of concentration, just just panicked when he saw the second striker coming at him, lost the ball in a in a terrible position. Um, you know, if he didn't have that, he, he'd be a top defender, but he has that, and that's why he, that's why he's that's why he's played in Portugal and now playing for Krasnodar instead of at a higher level. Yeah, you mentioned at the start there that it's. We've been discussing Kayo at a, quite a disproportionate level, but when he makes mistakes like this, as often as he is right now, they're quite hard to ignore, especially at the, the level he's making in the map. And it's there for all the world to see, the amount of people who watch Champions League games. Now, he's fine 90% of the time within games. And to be fair, in all three games, he's actually played quite well, these errors aside, like you said. But if you make these errors in the RPL, well, that's fine. Teams like Ufa aren't going to really force you to uh, force it to get you'll get away with it. Like they're not going to score and uh, and really make you suffer for these errors more than more often than not. But when you're playing the teams, the quality of Chelsea, the quality of Sevilla, 
that's, that's they, they're going to take advantage of that straight away. And I, th- I think it's at this moment, it's got into the back of his mind a little bit because the error that he made last night was purely based out of a lack of concentration. He actually looks like he's thinking about not making an error and makes an error, if you know what I mean. He's, he's not playing natural enough. He's, he's trying to force it too often. When he jumps in uh, in the Chelsea game, he doesn't... It's a harsh one because it's fine margins. If he gets that ball, it's a brilliant tackle. But the player was going nowhere and there was plenty back in defence. It's fine margins, but he doesn't need to play those fine margins. Just stand up your man, shepherd him away from goal. Doing what he did is playing the margin and no defender needs to do that on the reg. Defenders hate doing that on the regular. Managers hate the defenders doing that. They don't play the margins. You you, you play it safe. You only do it and you're absolutely forced to do. So I feel bad for Kyle because he is generally very good in games. But he needs to get this out of his system as soon as possible and needs to stop making these errors because they're all quite similar. Lack of concentration, lack of patience, jumping in. But it it's just disappointing because once again, we're talking about issues where Russian clubs are, are, are not taking the chances. And then so many unforced errors have resulted in this really disappointing European stage so far. So, Richard, we'll let you have the last word on Kayo and Krasnodar in general here is in in this sense. So do you think that they were outdone by quality on the day or individual errors? Or do you think it was just Sevilla far too good on the day? I think it was a combination of two. Um, I won't lay it all on Kyle's shoulders because Sevilla do have some very, very good players. Um even, you know, if, it, if the ante been been down to 10 men, even at 2-0 down, you want to put it past a side like Sevilla, who, despite them having a poor start domestically in La Liga, they've still got top players, you know, Rakitic, Ocampos, Koundé at centre-half. You know, they've still got some really good players. So, it, it, there's that aspect of it. But, but yeah, the, that error from Kayo was... It's just... It really, that's what, we, that's what we've been saying. You can get away with making an error like that against half the teams in the RPL. But when you come up against, you know, real top quality opponents in the Champions League or even the Europa League, they'll punish you. Um, and yeah, I think it's just too often with Kyle now, isn't it? But like I say, the foreigner limit, it restricts Krasnodar. But even with the Russian defender, even with having to buy in the Russian market, you know, with Krasnodar, they went and bought Alexei Ionov for, what was it, 3 million euros from um, Rostov? I mean, the, 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 could they not try to get... I mean, I know they were linked with Andrei Semyonov from um, Atmat. He's not perfect, but I think he'd be an upgrade on Kayo, and obviously he is Russian. So, I mean, they would have had to have paid him a decent amount of wages, one would wages one would think. But it's, mm. it's yeah, it, like we say, it, it highlights the prop. It highlights that they, that they would have to go for Semyonov. That kind of highlights that the foreign limit once again proving to be a bit of a problem for them. But... Yeah, it, there's not really much they can do until the summer when they can finally get a chance to, you know, see if they can move on a few of the foreign players and bring in some upgrades. Yeah, absolutely. And that is the overriding problem here is the foreign limit. They don't have the they don't have the ability to go out and buy more depth like some of the bigger teams do because of this entirely manufactured limit that's only imposed upon themselves. A foreign limit could work if every country in the world has a foreign limit upon the league. But that ain't ever going to happen. So it won't work. It's just automatically limiting the best teams in the country for the sake of nothing, really, because it doesn't, I can't say any long term tangible benefits from what the foreign limit has brought to the game. But anyway, David, we'll try and finish off on a plus. So Krasadov, of course, got some real strong youngsters and. One of those we're most happy, most proud to see do well was, of course, Matvey Safanov getting over his disaster last week. And it was really good to see him back on top form that we all know he can produce. Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, he was, he was on, you know, he was just on the top of his game all night. Uh, you know, pulled off some, some fantastic, just, he's just a good shot stopper. And that was what he did last night. Uh, you know, he didn't have to do a lot in terms of, you know, coming for balls in the air, uh, didn't have to do a lot of like rushing off his goal line. Uh, all he had to do was just you know, be there, be the man in goal uh, and pull off the shot stops that we know he can do. And he did. He, he was getting to almost everything, it seemed like. Um, you know, and, and we've, we've seen some stats now that he's he's got the most saves in the, in the group stage so far, which is 
perhaps uh, not a good measurement of uh, Krasnodar's start in the cup. Obviously, we, we all know the troubles they've been going through in terms of their squad. Um, but yeah, he, he was on fine form fine form last night and made, more than made up for his, his error. Uh, you know, he, can, he could do very little about the three goals. You know, the first one's a, a very good header from uh, Rakitic. The second one, you know, Kai has Kai put him in a very difficult position. Uh, and then the latter one, uh, you know, some just unlucky. It's, it's struck the post as he's come, come across. And, and to be fair, he almost, at the time, I thought he had saved it, uh, the follow-up from in this three. Uh, yeah, he got a very good hand to it, and it just went down into the court, into the side net in. Um, so he almost did it, to be fair. Uh, you know, it was a very good performance and uh, a well-deserved call up to the national team. And hopefully he'll get his debut in the friendly against Moldova next week. Yeah, absolutely. It'll be a nice little way to, to to round off his sort of form of late. And it's it's a shame that those errors came in the Chelsea game because that's the one that's going to get the most attention worldwide. Like the how many people watch the Premier League over the world? How many people watch Chelsea over the world? Yet they'll not see him against Club Bruges. They'll not see him against Sevilla when he pulls off an absolute string of brilliant saves. Two of them late on against Bruges were just world class. So it's a real shame, but once again, he he bounced back from that. Safanov has made errors in his career of late, but the getting fewer and far between, he's really becoming more and more consistent. And I wouldn't, I would expect him to really not make another high profile one for a long time after what happened to Chelsea. So obviously now he's going to like throw it in his net on Saturdays. <laughs> yeah. So discussing the RPL, we'll move on now to matters within the RPL of late. And as I mentioned at the start of today's episode, Siska are currently top of the RPL for the first time since September 2019. They achieved this with some great results of late. They've lost only one in nine and have won the last four, scoring 11 goals and conceding just two. Now, part of this is, of course, thanks to players who are returning from injury. Alan Zagoyev is playing more minutes again. Ego Deveev is back in the team. Mario Fernandez is back from COVID. And the big one, Ilja Akhmetov, has featured of late off the bench. So to focus on them for a bit, David, quick, just a quick one here. A couple of minutes. I'll limit it to a minute each here because we're, we're running short on time. But who have you been impressed by of late, David, in particular? Uh, my my pick uh, would be uh, Obliakov in the midfield. Um, I think he's had an excellent season so far. Um, I think I mentioned him or either on this podcast or on the uh, whatever this is podcast recently. Um, you know, he's been controlling that midfield. Uh, uh, you know, it's a very young midfield regardless of who goes in there. It's, it's Obli- Before, it was Oblikov, Akhmetov. Uh, currently, it's Ob- Oblikov, Mario Dishvili, occasionally Bistrovic, occasionally Jagoyev. You know, Jagoyev's got the experience, but even so, Oblikov is the guy who's in there controlling the team. And uh, I think he's really come 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 good this season and, and he's deservedly had his call up to the national team as well. So, uh my, my hat tip goes to Obliakov, who I think is having a, a real breakthrough season. And Richard, how about you? Anyone in particular you'd like to highlight for Suska? I'm going to pick Zayutdinov. I echo David's thoughts about Obliakov, but I'm going to echo Zayutdinov as well. I mean, he was probably the least high-profile transfer um, arrival this summer from them, you know, because they, they spent heavy on the likes of Bruno Fuchs, uh, Chidera Ijuke. Um, Adolfo Geish, they were the main three summer signings since Siska, but um, Zayutdinov's probably been their best signing so far, I think. You know, he's proven his versatility too. He's played on the left-hand side of midfield. He's um, in attacking midfield roles. He's also, looks like he's finding his home now at left-back. He's been playing there quite a lot recently. And, you know, he, he always seems to have a good, consistent game. You know, he's always, you know, seven out of ten in games, you know, Got good energy and stamina, you know, can whip whip good balls into the box, good at positioning himself, tracking back. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been very impressed with Zoutinov, very versatile. And um, he's been a real surprise for me, considering, um, you know, the other big names that Siska brought in. I think Zoutinov's been the real surprise and probably the best summer signing so far. So, Richard, as you mentioned, summer signings there, I'll come straight back to you. What do you think of... Chidera, Ejuke and Adolfo Geich so far. And in my opinion, Geich doesn't really fit Siska's system whatsoever. Now, there was David mentioned before the podcast that, of course, he recorded a, a podcast with a Feyenoord fan site. And, and they actually mentioned that Feyenoord were, were in for Geich in the summer but couldn't afford him. Uh, it, it just doesn't look like 
a player who fits Cisco's system. Cisco don't need a target man. Now, they could do with them for a plan B, but they don't ever try plan B. It's, it's They do the Cisco method, and if that doesn't work, then they don't score. Well, yeah, we were all saying that. I'm sorry for coming there. Yeah, we were all saying that um, in this early in the summer that you know before the season started that when they signed Geish, we were all thinking maybe they were going to go to two up front. You know, maybe go to a a three four one one two formation with you know being paired up being paired up front with Chaloff, and that never really materialised. And yeah, he's he, unless you can only really play him in a one man formation if you're going to play a four three three. I think he and and make him a real focal point of the attack make him you know a real you know player who's going to dominate a complete forward up front but yeah it just seems like he's not suited to this this formation that Gontrenko's playing and this style of play so this this signing is very odd for me guys you know I mean obviously I think there is a good player in there he's been capped by Argentina who's scoring a lot of goals with San Lorenzo in Argentina but but yeah I just think he looks ill suited to their tatics Ejuke on the other hand I think I think Ijuke is one of those players. He's he he was in Norway two years ago, and then he went to Herenveen in the Netherlands. And it's funny enough you mentioned um, Final Wanting Guys. Apparently on the pod that David spoke spoke on earlier, they were apparently also being linked with Ijuke Feyenoord. And you know, obviously Siska beat them to Ijuke as well. Um, so he, each time he's progressing his UK and, and developing. And you know, he, he's probably at the minute just lacking that final ball or that final touch or bit of composure up front but from what I've seen of him I have been impressed with him I just think he needs to just develop that final ball that final shot final action um, in the final third there's definitely something to work with though I think gradually as the year goes on I think he'll mature and I think he'll prove a very astute signing from Siska because it's just lack of experience I think because he's only 22 and he's you know he's progressing each time each club he's going at you know I think he was playing in Norway for a lower team then Heron Vane's a step up from that then Siska's a step up from Heron Vane so I think it. I think it will come with time. Um, he's certainly got the the tools to develop in the future. It's just. It's just. Just um, through an experience that a little bit of lack of something in the final third. But I think it will come with age. Yeah, hopefully he's very much just Cisco right now, where everything's brilliant up until the final third. Then the really he's really just missing that sort of star factor. Now, if I want to mention star factor, David's last word on Cisco. All I'll say, Nikola Vlasic, you can take it from there. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he's he seems to have taken his game to a whole different level this season for for club and country. Let's not forget he, he's scoring goals for Croatia now against you know some of the biggest teams in the world. He scored against um, against France in the last international break. But he, he he honestly looks like you know you know before this season, I think we all said Barrios was was probably the best player in the league. Um, I'm starting to think it's it's potentially now Vlasic. He, I don't know what's happened to him, but he I mean he was good already, but it almost seems like he's at that next level. Certainly mentally, he, he just seems like he knows he's better than these these guys. Uh, you know, he's he's just so good. Um, uh, and I'm thinking it's probably uh, going to be his last season in Russia, particularly if the Euros go ahead next season. Let's just say he Croatia make the Euros next summer uh, and, and they go ahead and he has a good Euros. He, he's 100% going to be off. And he's going to earn them a lot of money. You know, I don't know how much they paid Everton for him. Uh, it was not never really mentioned. I'm sure it was in the teens of millions. Uh, but they're certainly going to make a profit. Like I, I'd be expecting at least 30 million euros. Uh, and he, he's just, you know, he's fantastic. Yeah, he's been absolutely brilliant so far. And on that, we come to the end of the RFN podcast. Of course, we wanted to focus a little bit on on Cisco at the end because unfortunately, due to our recording time, it it has been difficult trying to fit them in. Because we record when Cisco playing, of course, as I speak. Cisco have just kicked off against Feyenoord, so nil nil right now. Hope hope for a good game and a good result for them against a team that won't sit back, won't sit with ten men behind the ball, and that should really favour Cisco. Now we'll finally get a bit of a breather after a busy month as European games take a two week break. And next weekend the international returns. As always, keep up our RFN on Twitter at Russ Football News. One of the usual spate of coverage from the RPL this weekend. David, where can everybody find yourself online? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at RFN underscore David. And Richard, how about yourself? Yeah, you can find me at, um, at RichDPike89. At RichDPike89. This has been the RFN podcast. Goodbye for now. 
футбольный матч летит над полем мяч. Веди его, беги, точнее его удар. Но мяч берет в ноги решительный вратарь. Не напрасно футбольное поле самых ловких и смелых плечов. Здесь нужны тренировка и воля, быстрота, увлечение, расчет.